Good evening, everyone. Welcome to this Solar 101 webinar. My name is Henry McKay. I'm the Pennsylvania Program Director of Solar United Neighbors. So I'm going to go through um, three main sections in this webinar. One, how a solar installation works, all the various components of a solar installation, panels, racking systems, inverters, and even batteries, how they generate electricity for you. Um, on your home or business. And then we're gonna talk about the different ways that we can help you go solar, in particular, the solar co-op process. And then we're gonna talk about some, some numbers, how much solar tends to cost, the different ways to pay for it, and how it saves you money. How do you think of this like an investment? Because that's really what it is. You're, you're spending money, usually upfront, and you're seeing savings over time. But before we get into that, I'm gonna do a quick introduction, um, talk about who we are, who is Solar United Neighbors, and how we got started. So we are a nonprofit organization. We're a national nonprofit organization, and our goal is to build a, an engaged and informed and effective movement of rooftop solar supporters. So we do that by helping people jo go solar, join together, and fight for their energy rights. Um, one of the primary ways we help people go solar is through programs like this and through solar co-ops, and we'll talk a lot more about that, um, as well as some other ways we can help you go solar. We got started back in 2007, um, and un uh, we got started in Washington, D.C. Unlike a lot of things that started in Washington, D.C., we have very grassroots origins. And it's really these two young men who learned about solar energy at school, um, and they went back home and they asked their parents, well, why can't we do this at home? Why can't we put solar panels on our own homes? So um, uh, this... This uh, young man on the left, his name is Walter, and his, his mother, Anya Schoolman, is now my boss. He asked his mom, and she looked into solar. This was 2007 again, so not only was it much more expensive than it was today, but it was confusing. There wasn't any good, reliable, consumer-facing information on how to do this in a smart, informed way. Um, so what they did is they decided if we're going to go solar, we're going to take the whole neighborhood with us. So they went around their neighborhood in Washington, D.C. This is the Mount Pleasant neighborhood. They knocked on doors. They got 50 of their neighbors signed up, other neighbors who wanted to go solar as well. And they called themselves the Mount Pleasant Solar Cooperative. They shared information about how all the process worked. And most importantly, they got one solar installer to do all of their homes. And that solar installer could save money on customer acquisition costs. They had to do less advertising and marketing to turn all these these leads into signed contracts, and they could pass those savings on to the participants in the form of a cheaper solar installation. So the solar cooperative was able to make the process easier and also a little bit more affordable. And we've taken the same model, the solar co-op model, and we've improved it and streamlined it and modified it in different ways. But essentially, this, still, this same core idea is what we're doing um, in an increasing number of states around the country and that has helped us grow and helped us take uh, you know, close to 3,000 people, or, sorry, 2,000 people solar through this process. We've run over 200 of these solar co-ops. And so I'm gonna talk a little bit more about that today. Uh, first, as I said, I'm gonna talk about solar technology, then we'll go over how solar co-ops work, and then some solar economics. So first, solar technology. Okay, so just a point of clarification at the top. What we're talking about here is solar PV technology, solar photovoltaic. This is turning light from the sun into electricity that you can use in your house. What we're not talking about is uh, what's often called solar thermal or solar hot, hot water, where you have similar kind of solar panels that would go up in your roof and they have a fluid in them that gets warmed by the sun and you use that heated fluid to do things like heat water and hot water in your home. That's a different technology, um, but we're talking about creating electricity from the sun with this webinar. And I'm gonna talk about the various components, the major components in a home solar system or, or on a small business, the panels themselves, the uh, solar inverter you can see represented by number two here, how it all collects into your electrical service panel, number three, and how this interacts through number four, your utility meter, and it has, and how this interacts with the, with the utility grid. So there are two important units to understand when we're talking about solar energy. The, there's the watt and the watt hour, or if you multiply each of those by a thousand, you have the kilowatt and the kilowatt hour. A watt is a measure of power, and a watt hour is a measure of energy. You measure the size of your solar system in kilowatts, so it's, it's most useful to talk to say, I have a 
uh, five kilowatt solar system rather than I have a solar system with 12 panels because different models of solar panel may be rated for a different number of watts. Using the watts really tells you the power production capacity, kind of how much firepower does your, your solar system have. You'll also pay, uh, your solar system will be priced by the watt, so you can compare bids from different solar installers by comparing dollars per watt. That's, that's an all-inclusive price. You take the whole, whole thing and divide it by the number of watts. And then watt hours uh, is, is how you would measure the amount of energy your system produced in a given period of time, in a given month. You might also recognize kilowatt hours from uh, your electricity bill. That is how you are billed from your utility. They're billing you based on the number of kilowatt hours that you've consumed in a particular billing period. So if you have a solar system that is, has more kilowatts, then in, the sa in, a, in a given period with the same sunlight conditions and the same orientation of those panels, it's gonna produce more kilowatt hours of energy than a system with fewer kilowatts. Most homeowners are going to install somewhere between, this is two, really uh, four and 12 kilowatts. That's, I think the average size nationally is still about seven and a half kilowatts, although plenty of people go much larger than that. In Pennsylvania, for example, a residential system can be as large as 50 kilowatts, and you can still be eligible for net metering. That's a pretty huge system. I don't know of anyone who has a system that large on their home. Um, the most important Component, of course, is the panels themselves. And um, you can see on the left here, uh, a, um, a, kind of a solar panel broken down. This, the blue rectangle in the center, those are the actual silicon cells. We're talking about silicon uh, technology. It's still the dominant technology for solar panels. So there's always interesting stuff right in the horizon that might be coming out soon. Um, but you have these little wafers of silicon that are wired together. And when the sunlight hits those, those pieces of silicon, it excites the electrons in them. The electrons flow, and a flow of electrons is an electric current, the same kind of electric current that you use in your home. And these panels, they're, they're protected by multiple layers. They're protected by shatter-resistant glass, so they're made to withstand strong winds, even hailstone impacts. They're, they're made to be fairly sturdy and durable pieces of equipment because they're out there exposed to the elements all year round. And when you link together multiple solar panels or solar modules, um, that forms a solar array. Solar panels produce direct current electricity, uh, um, DC electricity, but in your home, what comes out of your outlets is alternating current electricity or AC. So you need a device called a solar inverter that is going to turn that DC into AC so you can use it in your home. Now, the most traditional uh, option is something called a string inverter. You can see there on the left that red and black box. So this is one box that is that gathers all the electrical current from your solar panel, switches it from DC into AC, um, and then sends it into your electrical service panel. Um, and then on the other side of the screen, the microinverters is is a a fairly rapidly emerging new technology that a lot of people are using. And this is exactly what it sounds. It's a lot of a lot of um, miniature inverters, one attached right at the side of each solar panel. It does that same DC to AC conversion, but right at the side of the solar panel and then sends it into your home. And then the hybrid option in the middle is this uh, central, this, this uh, still one inverter, and then these DC optimizers, that smaller device in the bottom that attaches to the solar panel itself. Now there are trade-offs between which technology you might choose. Ultimately, it's a conversation between you and your installer as to what makes sense for your own preferences and situation and budget. Um, one reason you might choose, uh, so, so one advantage the microinverters and the DC optimizers have over a string inverter is, so your string inverter is always trying to maintain the ideal voltage and current level, so you're getting the maximum power out of your solar panels at any, at any given moment as the sunlight level changes, as shading changes. If you have enough of your solar system, enough of your panel shaded by a tree, for example, that would change those ideal voltage and current, current characteristics. And so it might drag down the efficiency of your whole system as that string inverter tries to find the lowest common denominator to compensate for those, you know, those handful of shady panels. But what microinverters and DC optimizers can do is they can do that calibration at a much finer level, at the panel level. And so ultimately what that means is uneven shade on your solar system will cause you to take less of a hit in terms of energy production. So a partially shaded system, it might make more sense to get microinverters or maybe DC optimizers. 
And then all of this connects right into your electrical service panel. So this goes, this electricity from your solar panels flows right into the general mix of electricity in your home. If there's not like a separate solar circuit where you're powering some, you know, some lights and your refrigerator from solar and everything else is coming from the grid. This is going into the general mix of electricity in your home. And it is a fairly simple connection. It's something your installer will do for you. It's something you probably won't need an upgrade on your service panel for. Um, but if you have a smaller electrical service panel or if you have one that's just not up to code, this will be the thing that makes you finally uh, upgrade that, that panel. And so um, the point here, this, this is a, a potential additional cost to going solar that you, you may not anticipate from the outset, but it's something to keep in mind if you have an older electrical panel. And then there's the racking system. So if you're doing a roof mounted system, it's how those solar panels attach to your roof. And so you can see here, there's these rails running across this asphalt shingle roof. The rails themselves are attached to the roof and they're actually drilled, there's holes drilled through the roof. And so the rails are bolted onto the rafters of your roof. So it's a very sturdy wind resistant connection. And then the panels are attached to the rails. Um, and in this case, this is an asphalt shingle roof and you can see these black squares below uh, along the rails. So to protect that penetration point where they drill the hole in your roof, there's ideally two types of um, protection. There is some kind of sealant poured into that hole, you know, uh, around the, the opening of the hole to keep water from flowing into it. And then that, that black square, that flashing, also directs water away from the hole uh, to provide a watertight connection. So you're not compromising your roof by putting solar on it. And this is a good measure of a, of a uh, a respectable solar installer is how well they protect your roof when they're drilling holes in it. Um, and there are lots of different types of racking systems for lots of different types of roofs out there in Pennsylvania. Installers are going to be most familiar with, with these asphalt or composite shingle roofs. And so you can see in the left here, another example of that sheet of metal, that flashing protecting the penetration point. But you can put solar on lots of different types of roofs in the middle is a standing seam metal roof. And you can see in this case, the racks are actually clamped onto that standing seam of the roof uh, so they can do it without any penetration. There's no holes drilled in your roof, which is always nice. Uh, and then you can do it on flat roofs as well. So um, also with flat roofs, they avoid drilling holes. Uh, and you usually have a ballasted system where there's no penetration, but the system, the rails are actually weighted down with, with bricks or cinder blocks um, to keep them there, keep them from blowing away in the wind. There are some roofs that are more problematic for solar um, slate and clay tile roofs. Uh, because they're more delicate, some installers just won't work on them at all, or some installers might say, they're, they're gonna, might charge a, a premium price um, to put the solar on there. So it's a bit more expensive to do solar on a slate or tile roof. And then, of course, you don't have to put it on the roof. You can put your solar on the ground if you have the space for it. Now, there's some trade-offs between a ground-mounted solar system or a roof-mounted solar system. One advantage of ground mount is that you can get those panels facing exactly the right direction and having exactly the right orientation. So ideally, panels, panels will produce the most if they're facing due south. And if they, the angle they're at is the angle of our latitude. They'll, they'll get the most direct sunlight throughout the year at that angle. If you're putting it on your roof, you're putting it whatever angle your roof happens, roof happens to be facing, but if you put them on the ground, you can get them oriented just right. Solar panels also work best when uh, they, can, they can stay cool. As solar panels get hotter, uh, the voltage they can handle goes down and they produce less electricity with the same amount of sun. If your panels are on the roof, there's less air, they're usually very close to the surface of the roof, only a few inches away, and there's less air that can circulate around your panel, so they tend to get hotter in the sun. But as you can see, a ground-mounted solar panel, there's more room underneath, there's more air circulation, they stay cooler, and they run a little bit more efficiently than a roof-mounted system. Now, on the other hand, ground-mounted solar systems are almost always more expensive. There's concrete that needs to be poured to um, actually fix it into the ground, and there's usually a trench that needs to be dug to carry that power line from the solar panels themselves to your home or business. Um, that adds extra cost, and so that means it's usually a more expensive installation. And of course, you need to have the space for it, and you're taking up space in your, on your property that might be able to be used for something else, whereas your roof is space that you weren't, you weren't using. So there's trade-offs there. 
So not every site is good for solar. Um, I've, I've seen statistics where something like half or maybe even three quarters of buildings in Pennsylvania are not appropriate for, for solar, and that is because they don't meet uh, these three criteria. So one, you wanna have your solar panels facing ideally due south, although it really can be anywhere between east, due south, and west, and that's because we are in the northern hemisphere, so the sun is generally to the south in the sky. You want to have no shading or uh, ideally no shading, but as little shading as possible because if you're blocking the sun, you're blocking the electricity you can produce. And you want to have enough space. And the rule of thumb is about at least 250 square feet of unbroken contiguous space on your roof or on the ground. As, a, as If you have to break up that solar installation into multiple roof faces or it's, it's obstructed by chimneys or dormers on your roof, um, that can make it a little less feasible, it might add to the cost of the installation, take away from your expected energy generation, um, and make it a little more challenging to go solar. Although I, I live in Pittsburgh and we have very complicated roofs in Western Pennsylvania, so there are plenty of very viable solar installations on complicated, busy Western Pennsylvania roofs. And then there are batteries. So it's becoming increasingly popular for people to add batteries to their solar system, batteries that are charged by the solar panels and that they draw from, from during power outages. And that's because, so most people think, well, if I have solar and there's a power outage in my neighborhood and the sun is shining, I should still have electricity. Well, except for two exceptions, one big one and one little one, that is unfortunately not the case. So generally speaking, if you have solar panels and there's a power outage in your neighborhood, your panels will automatically shut off when they detect that power outage. And this is a safety feature. It's required by state regulations. Basically, your solar system is capable of pushing electricity back out onto the electricity grid. But the utility is going to be assuming all those power lines are dead because it's an outage, and they might be sending line workers to climb up those poles and fix, excuse me, fix whatever, you know, whatever transformer exploded. So if those lines are, are actually live when they think they're dead because your solar system is pushing electricity back out on them, somebody could get hurt. So that's why your system automatically, sh automatically shuts off. So the small exception to this, to this uh, rule is if you have an inverter with, with a feature called a secure power supply or SPS, and what a secure power supply does is it's essentially just an electrical outlet right in your solar inverter. And when there's a power outage, your system will still stop feeding your electrical service panel, you won't be getting any more power in your house from the solar panels. But if you plug an extension cord right into that secure power supply, you can run a few loads right off of that directly from the inverter, directly from your solar, as long as the sun is shining. And then the big exception to this rule is if you install batteries. So your batteries are kept charged by your solar panels and they stay charged. You don't use them until the event of a power outage. And then you start drawing from those batteries during the power outage. Um, batteries are still fairly expensive. Um, they'll add significantly to the cost of your solar installation. They are getting cheaper all the time, but they, they still are very expensive. So, um, and all they can do is provide this backup power for you in the event of outages. And because they're so expensive, most people are really only installing enough batteries to power a few critical loads at, uh, at their home for a limited amount of time. So they're taking you know, maybe a refrigerator, maybe some lights, maybe a modem, maybe a few outlets so you can charge your phone, putting those in a separate circuit and having the battery able to power those. Um, so we really only recommend that, that people get batteries if, if there is a strong need for them. So if you live somewhere with frequent utility outages and that backup power is really valuable to you, it might make sense to pay for batteries. If you have critical electric loads at home, like medical equipment, maybe electric well pumps, it might make sense to spring for those batteries. Or if you just wanna be prepared in the event of emergencies or natural disasters. Now someday in the future, there may be other benefits to having batteries in Pennsylvania. There are other states, Maryland, for example, where if you have enough batteries, you can actually get paid to participate in something called the frequency regulation market. So the utility wants to have just the right voltage and current or frequency of electricity on those power lines. Um, and often it's challenging for them to maintain just those right characteristics, but your batteries can push, push out little bits of energy to help maintain those ideal characteristics. Um, and the electric, the electric utility uh, values that, so they, pay, they would pay people for it. 
So in Maryland, you can do this. If you have enough batteries, you can actually get paid for your batteries helping to surf the grid like this. Unfortunately, that's not the case in Pennsylvania right now. Uh, and we'd have to change the rules of the grid to be able to do that. But right now, batteries are just useful as backup power in, in Pennsylvania. So all of these components together, the solar panels, the inverter, um, this is how they work. So let's imagine it's a, it's a really sunny day your panels are drenched in sunshine and maybe you're out of the home, so you're uh, not really using that much electricity. So your, your panels are gonna generate DC electricity. It's gonna travel down to your inverter. So that's number two here on the flowchart. Your inverter is gonna switch that from DC into AC, and then it's gonna send that AC electricity into number three, your electrical service panel. And, your, and it's gonna go into your home. Whatever electricity you're using in your home at the moment is gonna draw from, right from those solar panels. Now, because it's a really sunny day and you're out of the house, you probably have some extra electricity left over that you don't need. That is gonna go right out through number four, your utility meter, and right out to the grid. And the utility is gonna resell it to uh, your neighbors down the street, you know, whoever, whoever's closest to needs that electricity. And you're gonna get credited for that excess production. You're gonna get credited um, for those extra kilowatt hours that you exported. And you're gonna accumulate credits on your electric bill and then, Let's say it's a not very sunny, you know, typical winter day in Pennsylvania where you may be generating a little bit of electricity, but not as much as you need at home at the moment. So, uh, but if you had built up those excess, uh, so whatever you, whatever you need, um, you'll draw from your solar panels and you'll need some more and you'll draw that from the grid and you'll pay the utility for those extra kilowatt hours. But if you had built up bill credits during the sunnier times of year, you'll instead spend down those extra bill credits. So th this is a process where even though it's not evenly sunny all year, you could build a solar system that covers your entire year's worth of energy usage because you can overproduce in the summer, bank up credits, and then use those credits during the less sunny times of the year. So this process where your electric meter actually runs both ways like this is called net metering. So your, your meter is measuring what you're putting out to the grid and also what you're drawing in. And your monthly electric bill is actually just on what you used minus whatever electricity you produced. Now, utilities in Pennsylvania, investor-owned utilities in Pennsylvania, I should say, are required to let you net meter. And they're required to let you net meter at a one-to-one -one rate. So you can see here a list of all of the 11 investor-owned utilities in Pennsylvania. These are the big utilities. Most people are customers of these utilities in Pennsylvania. And they're required by law to let you net meter and for every kilowatt hour of electricity you export to them, they're required to give you a credit worth one kilowatt hour. So it's called retail rate net metering or a one-to-one -one net metering. Now, uh, if, you, if your electric utility is a municipal utility, it's owned by a local government, or if it is a um, rural electric co-op, if you're in a more rural area, they, don't, they aren't regulated by the state in the same way and they can kind of follow their own rules according to net metering. So they, don't, they aren't required to offer the same net metering arrangement, but most of them do, um, but it will often be at a uh, less lucrative rate for you or maybe subject to caps, like only, you know, you can only build a system so large that covers 110% of your energy usage in a year or only 1% of their customers can, can use net metering or something like that. Um, so there's usually more limitations with municipal utilities and rural electric co-ops, but you are um, most likely able to get, a, get a, a net metering policy through those utilities as well. I should say that even though Pennsylvania is not always thought of as a good solar state, we have one of the best net metering policies in the country. And it's better than a lot of states that you would think of to be good, uh, good for solar. For example, Arizona is incredibly sunny, one of the sunniest states in the country, but they recently killed their net metering law um, under pressure from utilities. And utilities often will try to attack net metering laws um, because uh, essentially because it cuts into shareholder profits, it cuts into their business model of selling more kilowatt hours of electricity and earning a profit on that. So that's one of the reasons it's really important to have a vibrant, robust solar movement in Pennsylvania so that, so that we can work with you to, to help defend important policies like net metering. So this is the last slide of the section. I'll go through some frequently asked questions. Um, and then if you have any more questions, you can ask them by either raising your hand or typing them into the question box and, and we'll address them right now. 
First, warranties. There are a number of different warranties on a home solar system. The uh, panels or inverter and inverters themselves will have a manufacturer's warranty, just like any appliance you'd buy. So this is protecting you against manufacturing defects, manufacturing defects in the product. Uh, for solar panels, it's usually something like 10, 12, 15 years. Similarly, for string inverters, microinverters often have longer warranties, 20, 25 years. Um, and all of these are, are sometimes extendable. If you pay an extra fee, you can get the extended warranty. And then your installer will usually offer some kind of labor warranty covering the work they're doing on your home, or maybe it's it's, it's called a, a roof protection warranty, so a roof penetration warranty, protecting you against specifically any leaks that might emerge from those roof penetration points. Those are usually for five years. And then importantly, there's something called the production warranty attached to your solar panels. This also comes from the manufacturer, and this is a, um, a guarantee of how slowly those solar panels will degrade in efficiency over time. So as solar panels age, they get a little less, a little less efficient every year, um, just as they're heating and cooling in the sun and, and just natural wear and tear. And that production warranty tells you how slowly that degrade, degradation will happen. So sometimes it's expressed as uh, by 20, at year 20, your system will be at least 80% of its original factory efficiency, or maybe it'll say every year your system's going to reduce in efficiency by 1% or half a percent or one and a half percent. This is one way to compare one solar panel to another is how slowly does it does it degrade in efficiency. And then the other, the, the manufacturer's warranty um, is another way of, of comparing one solar panel to another. How well is that warranty protecting you against any problems with that solar panel? Homeowners insurance. Um, going solar may affect your homeowners insurance. It may increase your premiums because it essentially adds to the rebuild value of your home and the rebuild, the higher your rebuild value, the higher premiums tend to be. So, uh, and then in some rare cases, uh, going solar may actually reduce your, your, your insurance premiums if your insurance company has some kind of um, green incentive program where they're trying to encourage people to do sustainable things like going solar. So we highly recommend talking with your insurance company if you are thinking about going solar, getting an estimate from them about what will happen to your premiums should you decide to go solar. As for maintenance, solar systems are, are low maintenance systems. There are no moving parts on them. Um, the panels themselves, as I said, are very durable and will last 20, 25, 30 years. Um, so you shouldn't expect very much maintenance over the life of your solar system. Solar inverters tend to last about half the life of, a solar, of the solar panel, so you will probably have to replace your, your string inverter once during the life of the system, although microinverters will likely last um, the entirety of the life of your system. And um, you know, if you have roof-mounted solar panels, we don't even really recommend getting up there and cleaning off, cleaning the snow off, um, mostly because that's dangerous and also because solar panels are dark covered once a little bit of, um, you know, once if they're covered in snow, once a little corner gets gets uncovered, uh, that'll warm up pretty quickly in the sunlight, warm up the rest of the panel, and that snow will melt off. And really, if your solar panels are covered in snow, you're only missing a couple days or even just a day of of sunlight with them covered in snow. Um, and really, it's January sunlight you're probably missing out on, not you know uh, intense July sunlight. So you're not leaving a lot of energy on the table if you're leaving that snow on your panels. They'll even work with some snow on them. It has to be a fairly thick layer of snow for them to not work at all. How long do systems last? I think I said this a few times already, but this is, this is a, a long-term investment. This is a system that will be producing on your home for 25 or more years. So if you are thinking of moving soon, it may not be the right time to go solar. Um, if your roof has less than a decade or so of life in it, now is not the right time to go solar. We, we highly recommend not putting solar on a an old roof. So because if you have to do work on that roof and you have panels on it, you got to pay somebody to take those panels off, put them back on again, and that's not cheap. Now, as for, as for um, if you do move out of your home in the middle of the life of your solar system, there is strong evidence to suggest that going solar adds to the value of your home. There was a big study done by the Lawrence Berkeley National Laboratories where they looked at 22,000 home sales across eight states. Pennsylvania happened to be one of them. 
Some had solar, some didn't, and they found that there was a consistent price premium added for the homes with solar. So the homes with solar could sell for more. There's also some evidence to suggest that a solar home sells more quickly. And that might be because it's just, it's, it's more memorable. You know, people see, you know, a, a dozen or so homes when they're shopping around for a house and they'll remember that one that has solar on it. And so it, it can sell more quickly. So that's, that's to say that you may be able to rec recoup some of your remaining investment if you do sell your home with solar on it. Um, although, you know, we can't guarantee that you're going to recoup what you would have saved in electricity savings uh, during the life of the system. Now, if you live in a community that is governed by a homeowners association, if you're a member of a homeowners association or similarly a condo association, unfortunately in Pennsylvania, they can't, they do have full discretion to just stop you from going solar should they choose to. Um, even if it's on, you know, something as, as seemingly petty as, as, as aesthetic concerns, they just don't like how they look. Um, there are some states that have what are called solar access laws that give you a right to go solar and limit the ability of HOAs to block their residents from going solar. But Pennsylvania is not one of those states yet. We're, we're trying to change that. Um, but um, an HOA may, may block you from going solar. Now, if you're going solar and you live with an HOA, we highly recommend engaging with them in advance, um, trying to educate them about solar. And we actually have a toolkit for doing just this. So it's called our HOA Solar Action Guide. And that can help you um, engage with your HOA, build support from your neighbors, and provide fact-based um, arguments to help preempt any misconceptions they might have about how solar works or how, or importantly how it affects home values. You can find that on our website if you search for solar HOA action toolkit. And then also if you live in a historic district or if your home is a historic home um, that might prevent you from going solar if you're limited on what you can do to the exterior of the home. It might force you to put the solar on the back of the home so it's not visible from the street. Um, and it will likely just be an additional permit that you have to get and potentially additional permit fee that you have to pay. Um, so that's something to keep in mind. Okay, that is the end of that first section. So I'm gonna talk about the, uh, the solar co-op process and then in general, the different ways that we can help you go solar. So we have two main ways we, we can help you go solar. Um, one is this solar co-op membership which I, I spoke about briefly before so this is a this is a group of people going solar within a given geographic area often a, a city a county or maybe even multiple counties um, and it's a group going solar uh, all with one installer somewhere between 50 and 100 neighbors it takes it can take six to eight months um, by going as a group with one installer, you can drive down the cost a little bit and get a pr better price on an installation, but everyone is still signing their own individual contract for their own individual solar system on their own property. So there's no big shared solar array that you're getting. And by be being a member of a co-op, you also get a free membership to Solar United Neighbors, which comes with some, some additional benefits. And so I wanna emphasize the solar co-op is free. It's always free to join a solar co-op. You never pay us anything to be part of a solar co-op. Um, the only thing you would pay is if you should decide to sign a solar contract with the installer as part of that co-op, then you, of course, would be paying for that solar installation to the installer. Now, if co-op membership isn't your thing, if you want to move at your own pace, if there isn't a co-op available when you are, or if you just want kind of a more customized process, we have individual membership. Now, this does cost $85 to become an annual member of Solar United Neighbors, um, but we will help you specifically Throughout the process, we'll help you review up to three proposals from solar installers. We'll help you negotiate a good deal for yourself. You move at your own pace, and we provide a lot of customized advice for you to help you make an informed, confident decision about going solar. And then you get additional perks of being a member of Solar United Neighbors. So the solar co-ops are um, something we've done many times before. We've, we've run over 200 of these and, and helped a couple thousand people go solar through this process. So it is a very well-oiled machine and we consistently see benefits from it. One is potentially getting a better deal on a solar installation, um, leveraging your collective buying power to get a better deal. You get support from Solar United Neighbors. So you have your own nonprofit advisor guiding you through this process, helping you get more than just a sales pitch when you're making this decision. 
It can be more fun because you're connecting with other solar enthusiasts in your area like yourself. And you, you feel like you're making a larger impact because you are, because it's not just your own home going solar, it's you and a lot of your neighbors and fellow, fellow community members. You're making a bigger impact. And then once the solar co-op process is finished, we don't just end our relationship with you unless you want us to, uh, but we help you become part of this growing solar movement. We hope you stay connected with changes in technology, changes in policy, um, related technologies like batteries and electric vehicles. And should utilities in Pennsylvania and, and their lobbyists try to attack net metering, for example, we'll help you know about it, we'll help you know what to do, and help you fight it um, so we can defend important policies like that. So who can join a solar co-op? It's, it's really anyone in that co-op's territory who owns their home or business property or, and who wants to go solar in the next few months. So when you join the solar co-op, we don't make you commit to going solar. We don't wanna kind of add more, more risk to this process for you, but we do ask that you are pretty sure that you wanna go solar so we don't have a lot of people who are joining and only a few people who are signing a contract. But if you do decide not to sign a contract, you see it's just not a good price for you or something comes up and you're not able to afford it anymore, there's no penalty to backing out and not going solar. And you're also welcome to shop around with other installers and see if you can get a better deal on your own. And remember, we're not in this to help to kind of push you into a sale. We're trying to help you make a really informed, confident decision about going solar when it's right for you. So the solar co-op process, uh, these are the steps. This is the you know, roughly eight month process, how it works. So the first step is to learn about a solar co-op by uh, visiting, uh, participating in one of these webinars like this or attending one of our in-person info sessions. And then if you decide now is the right time for you to go solar, you sign up to join the solar co-op. I'll have a link for where you can do that for one of our active co-ops um, in a few moments. But what happens when you sign up is you give us your address and um, we will do a preliminary roof assessment to, to see if you are likely uh, capable of installing solar at your property. And we'll be able to tell you that uh, fairly quickly and let you know if you're, if you're barking up the wrong tree or not. And you'll also, um, and, then, and then we'll work to uh, grow the solar co-op. And we work with local partners. We, we do uh, advertising. We try to get local press uh, covering the solar co-op. But really the most powerful way that these co-ops grow the most successful co-ops grow because members of the co-op, people who have been to these info sessions, people like you on this webinar, tell their friends and neighbors and say, hey, there's this opportunity to go solar. I'm pursuing it, you should do it too. That's the best way to grow solar co-ops and we can give you tools to help you, help you grow it if you get in touch with us. Once we hit about 30 participants in a solar co-op, we select an installer. The way we do that is we, as Solar United Neighbors, we put out a request for proposals. We ask all the solar installers in that area who service that area um, to submit a bid for um, a group rate. You know, what would you charge everybody in the solar co-op for a sol their own solar installation? Now, we don't vet any of those solar installers. We, we think it's really important that we remain installer neutral. So it doesn't even appear like we have some buddies over in a solar installation company who we're handing off a bunch of your business to. We want to help the co-op pick that solar installer. So we collect those bids in from the installers. We do a little bit of homework on them. We'll call their customer references. We will make sure they're properly insured. Uh, we'll make sure they're properly licensed with the state as home improvement contractors. But we'll essentially compile all that data, we'll put it in a spreadsheet so it's easy to compare, and we'll ask members of the co-op to volunteer to, to be on the selection committee. And it's the selection committee itself that actually reviews all those bids, usually on a weeknight and a weekday evening uh, around somebody's kitchen table as a group, reviewing those bids and picking the, the deal, picking the installer that I think is offering the best deal for that co-op. I'm there in those meetings, helping that selection committee make a decision, helping them answer questions, but it's ultimately that committee's decision over who's gonna get the co-op's business. And the way they do that is, um, whenever you join, when you join the solar co-op in the application, we ask you, what are you looking for in a good solar installer? What are your priorities? Is it price? Is it strong warranties? Is it a company that's local? It's a company with a good track record? Maybe it's a company that offers 
um, domestically made solar panels and other products. Um, you tell us what those preferences are, and then when the selection committee meets, they see everybody's responses to those questions. So they know what the co-op as a whole is looking for, so they can pick accurately on behalf of the entire solar co-op. Once they pick that solar installer, that installer gets the list of leads, the list of members in the co-op, and they can start contacting them, scheduling a site visit with you, uh, and developing customized proposals at the group pricing rate. And then we work uh, one last time, usually it's about two months, uh, to grow the co-op as large as possible before that sign-up deadline hits. And, and throughout this time, the solar installer is doing those site visits and you're signing contracts with the installer and they're actually starting the installations. Now, once everyone who wants to go solar in the co-op has their system installed, we have a celebration and we celebrate doing something really cool together, going solar and we talk about what's next in the solar movement. Uh, how can you help make it easier for more people to go solar and how can you help protect this, this investment that you just made into solar? So, uh, if you want to find out where we have open co-ops that you can join in Pennsylvania, you can visit solarunitedneighbors.org slash co-ops slash Pennsylvania. You can see the link right here. Now, what if you don't live in an area that has an open solar co-op? Well, one option is you can become a member of Solar United Neighbors, an individual member like I discussed earlier, and you can access our solar help desk and we can help you go solar. You can see the link there to become a member. If you happen to live in Southeast PA, <clears throat> excuse me, specifically Bucks, Chester, Delaware, or Montgomery counties, you can participate in a program called Solarized Southeast PA. Um, this is not formally affiliated with Sun, but they, it is run by some great solar advocates, very knowledgeable solar advocates who are also solar powered, powered themselves in the Philadelphia area, um, who are similarly to a solar co-op, taking a group of people solar, using that group to drive down the price of an installation. You can see the link here, solarizesoutheastpa.wordpress.com for more information, or you can contact Meenal Raval here. You can see her email address right there on the slide. And then if you're really gung-ho about this and you, uh, you wanna help us start a solar co-op in your area, you can email us at pateam at solarunitedneighbors.org and we can talk about what it takes to start a solar co-op there. And really what it takes is motivated volunteers in the ground who can help us reach people in that area about going solar. And I should say this is, at least for now, this is Western Pennsylvania only. We only have the staff uh, to, run Pencil to run solar co-ops in the Western part of the state, which we're calling roughly Center County to the West um, as Western Pennsylvania. Okay, solar economics. So a few considerations at the top, as I said before, solar is priced by the watt, not by the panel. So you should be able to compare each bid by taking the whole price and, and, and bundling it into a dollars per watt and that lets you compare the price of each bid from each installer, regardless of how large a system or small a system you might want to install. Solar is a long-term investment. It's something that's gonna be working on your house, generating electricity for, for 25 plus years. And the way to think about your solar investment and, and how, um, how good of an investment it is, is you're thinking about what it costs you to go solar. So how cheap can you get that solar installation? And what is it going to save you? And your savings are a function of what you're paying for electric right now, how many dollars per kilowatt hour you're paying right now. The more expensive your energy is, the faster your solar payback will be. And how, how quickly that cost is going to rise over time. Now, in Pennsylvania, electric utility prices rise about one to 2% per year. This is data from uh, Penn State, uh, actually originally from the Federal Energy Information Administration. And you can see from 2005 to 2014, for example, prices have risen about one to 2% a year. And we expect that to continue in the future. So when your solar installer is estimating what your, your savings and your production will be over the life of your system, they should be taking into account some level of uh, electric utility price growth over over time. Now, the conservative es es the conservative estimate you can see here is one to two percent a year. So you want to look at that estimate from your from your installer and see are they using a really high number like six, eight, ten percent per year? That'll make your payback look better, but might be fairly unrealistic about uh, unrealistic expectations about what might actually happen to those utility prices. So that's something to keep in mind when you're reviewing your proposal. 
Now, solar has gotten dramatically cheaper in recent decades. Since the 70s, the costs have come down 90%. So it's no longer the specialty boutique product that only a few people can afford, that you know, people are doing it purely out of environmental concern, but they're not saving any money on it. Now it is, it is really a mainstream product. Many middle-class households are doing this. Even lower-income households are doing this. And people are really seeing this as a way to save money, to take control of their energy while also doing something that is good for the environment, generating cleaner, no emissions electricity. Despite all that though, it's not cheap by any means still. So uh, it still can be a daunting thing to tackle. It still can be intimidating. And that is one of the reasons we exist to help you do this in an informed way. So solar costs, this is a kind of another version of the same statistics. You can see costs have come down fairly quickly over recent years. Um, this is the cost of a solar installation over time. And we've broken out these color bars are the types, uh, the components of that cost. So the, the reddish orange bar at the top here is, um, well, sorry, at the bottom, the, the yellow bar at the bottom is the system components, so the panels themselves, the inverters, the racking systems, the different pieces of hardware that your installer is using. The gray bar is labor, and then the orange and red bar at the top is the soft cost. And so you can see as the cost of a solar installation has shrunk, that's largely, largely been driven by uh, falling labor costs and especially falling hardware costs. What has remained stubbornly the same is those soft costs, customer acquisition, marketing, essentially how the money they have to spend in turning a, a um, lead, a potential customer into an actual signed contract. And what solar co-ops can do is actually help reduce those soft costs, something that is challenging for installers to do on their own. So we can help lower those soft costs, help the installer save money, and then in turn help the customer save money. So here's some example pricing. Um, this isn't a guarantee of what you might actually pay going through a solar co-op. This is just some, some ballpark numbers to give you an idea of what this tends to cost and uh, what the payback periods tend to be. So you can see at the top line here, this is based on our average PA solar co-op pricing of $2.53 per watt. So as of the time of this recording, July 15th, 2019, that is the average price across all of our solar co-ops in Pennsylvania. That's the average price that we've, we've seen from installers. And that is a, is a pretty competitive price based on the Pennsylvania market. That's in the low end, perhaps lower than what you, you could get going on your own. Um, and so at that, at that rate, a, we'll say a, a mid-sized mid eight kilowatt system, so the, the bar on the right here, that sticker price is gonna be $20,000, 240. Um, now you can take a 30% federal tax credit off of that. So that takes $6,000 off of that sticker price and that leaves you with a net cost of $14,000 about. So that is a tax credit. Um, it's not a tax deduction. So your, your tax bill the next year after you go solar is reduced by 30% of the cost of your solar installation. Uh, it is not a refundable tax credit though. So you, if you don't have enough tax appetite in a single year, you can roll that over for multiple years to get that whole 30%. Now, if you don't have, if you don't, if your income is low enough to not pay any taxes, then of course that tax credit is, is not gonna be helpful to you. Um, and it's also important to note that the, that 30% federal tax, federal tax credit is not going to be 30% indefinitely. It's only 30% until the end of this year. Uh, if your solar system is installed, if, the, if it's completed, after the end of 2019, then you're only gonna get a 26% tax, tax credit, the year after that 22%, and the year after that 0%. This is for residential, um, for commercial properties going solar. Instead of going to zero, it goes down to 10% and stays there indefinitely. I know there are some efforts in Washington to extend the tax credit. It was extended once before in 2015. So there's a chance we might extend it again, uh, but there's no guarantee. So that's something to keep in mind. Um, if you are thinking about going solar in the near future, it might be worth trying to do it this year so you can get that full 30%. So back to the pricing slide, that eight kilowatt system, your, your, then your net cost after the tax credit is $14,000. Um, I'm gonna skip this solar renewable energy credit line just for now and explain it in a moment. We estimate that a typical home might see about $1,000 of electricity savings in the first year from their solar. 
now we're making, of course, a lot of assumptions on what you're paying for electricity and how much energy you use. Um, so that number, of course, may vary. Um, after, at this rate, after a decade, that's going to be more like $10,000. And so you can see 12, maybe 13 years, that home will have paid off, um, will have saved $14,000 and will have broken even. They'll have hit that payback point where they saved as much as they spent going solar. But that system is going to last 25 plus years. So that means lifetime savings of almost $30,000. And so your net profit, uh, the savings minus the net cost, is over $15,000. And then with a smaller system, you can see your uh, net profit is smaller, but of course your net upfront cost is smaller as well. So that is really just addressing the, the um, electricity savings that come from going solar. There is another revenue stream you have access to as a solar owner in Pennsylvania called SRECs, S-R-E-Cs, or Solar Renewable Energy Credits. The way these work is every time your system generates a thousand kilowatt hours of solar or one megawatt hour of solar, you earn one SREC. And that SREC has a cash value. You can sell it and get money for it. Utilities are buying these SRECs as a way to meet some regulatory requirements. Essentially, Pennsylvania has said all our big investor owned utilities need to get at least half a percent of their energy that they sell from solar by 2021 because utilities in Pennsylvania can't build their own power plants, they can't build their own solar farm to count against that goal, what they do is they buy SRECs from existing solar, um, solar owners like potentially you. So they're buying those SRECs to meet the compliance requirements and then the solar owners are getting some revenue that helps defray the cost of going solar. Now, you can see for the eight kilowatt system, we estimate a home might have $340 of SREC, SREC income in a single year. That's not a huge amount of money. It actually used to be a lot less, but still um, our SREC market in Pennsylvania is not great. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, so all, all of last year, the price was somewhere between $8 and $12, I believe. Um, now in 2019, the price has gone, I think, above $35, so it's improved a lot. And, and the reason our SREC market is not great in Pennsylvania is really basic Econ 101. So one, there's low demand for SRECs because our state solar goal uh, called our solar carve out, half a percent by, of electricity by 2021 is so low, there's not a lot of demand from utilities to be buying these SRECs. And then also until not that long ago, there was a real oversupply of SRECs in Pennsylvania. That's because until recently, anyone with a solar system kind of all around the eastern and even parts of the Midwestern United States as far away as like North Carolina could sell their solar, their SRECs into Pennsylvania. That flooded our market, it pushed the price down. So you have an oversupply and you have low demand and that means uh, low price. Now, at the end of 2017, we passed a law in Pennsylvania that closed our solar borders. That essentially means that going forward, only systems, solar systems in Pennsylvania could sell their SRECs here. That law seems to have kicked in at the beginning of this year, so that's why we started to see some pretty rapid growth in SREC prices. Uh, the market has improved a lot, although I should say that we don't expect that growth to continue indefinitely because our solar carve-out sets a goal of half a percent by 2021. That's not that far away. And we are on track to meet that goal. We set an unambitious goal for ourselves in Pennsylvania, and we're going to meet it. Once we hit that goal, the growth in solar will no longer be driven by this SREC market. We're going to see uh, weaker SREC prices um, and potentially even job losses in the solar sector. So it is important to raise that goal, to continue ratcheting it up so we can keep uh, incentivizing more solar to be built on the grid um, and making increasingly cleaner and, and fairer electric grid. So that, that was all an example of, of paying with cash for your solar installation. That is not the only way you can pay for solar, um, an upfront cash payment. You can also finance it using a loan, or you can do some a type of third-party ownership. And this graph is a way to compare those three different ownership models, those three different payment models. So the x-axis here is time, is years, and the y-axis, if you're above the middle, it is a net saving, and if you're below, it is a net cost. The dark blue bars here are a cash purchase. So you can see in year zero, there's a big outlay of cash to pay for that solar installation. 
then year one, you get 30% back with a tax credit, assuming you can get the whole thing in that first year. And then over time, you're saving money on electricity and, and um, recouping that initial, initial investment. At some point, looks like a little before year 13, you break even. And then by the end of 25 years, you have pretty substantial net savings from your solar. Now you can also take out a loan to pay for your solar installation. Uh, installers will often have some kind of financing partner where they'll offer you a special solar loan that you can use. Um, there are other solar loans out there in the market offered by different financial institutions you can shop around for. And you can even use really any kind of secured or unsecured personal loan like a home equity, home equity line of credit to pay for your solar. And in that case, you, you are borrowing, so you avoid that big upfront cost. So you can see the um, light blue bars here. You avoid, avoid the big upfront cost, and then you're paying off those loan, loan payments, um, in this case, over the course of a 15-year loan. And those loan payments are mitigated by the electricity savings you're seeing every month. At some point, after 15 years, you've paid off that loan, and then you have free electricity for, for another decade or so. And so you still end up with the light blue bars with pretty substantial savings, so they're not as large as if you had paid cash, but you avoided that big upfront cost. And then the third option is something called third-party ownership. Um, there's two types of this. One is a solar lease, where um, you're, you're leasing the solar system from your installer, and one is called a power purchase agreement, where similarly, uh, in both of these cases, you never own that solar system. The solar installer puts it on your home for free. They maintain ownership of it. They're in charge of any maintenance with it, and you are paying them a bill every month. If it's a lease, you're paying just a lease payment, and if it's a PPA, you're paying them a fee based on how many kilowatt hours your system produced in that month. And so the way this works, um, if it's a good deal, and it doesn't necessarily always a good deal, but if you get a good deal on, on a lease or PPA, um, if you add up your now smaller electric bill with your new solar bill, that would be less than your, you were originally paying on your electric bill before you went solar. So this way you could see net savings in the first month of going solar and accumulate those savings over time. And that's the green bars here. But you can see in most cases your savings from that lease or PPA are going to be lower than had you financed or done a cash purchase. And now also something to keep in mind, you don't own the system. So if you want to sell the system during the, the middle of that contract contractual agreement, you're going to have to get your home buyer to assume the remainder of the lease or PPA, or you're going to have to buy out the remainder of it. And that could be expensive. Um, now every company who offers these leases or PPA says, says we'll make this process of uh, home sale seamless and easy for you, although there are people who have, challenge, have had challenges with this. Um, often it comes when the homeowner doesn't fully understand the terms of the contract they signed. Um, and so by extension, the real estate agents don't understand it as well. And so it could be kind of a rude surprise late in the process when they realize, hey, there's a leased solar system, you don't own it. Maybe there's a lien on the property um, and it can um, cause problems with the home sale. Uh, another thing to keep, keep in mind with these leases or PPAs is sometimes there's an escalator built in. So you might be paying one price for your solar the first few years, and then it starts to rise you know, a few percentage points each year after that. And you wanna make sure it doesn't rise so fast that it overtakes your expected savings from the solar. So that is to say that there's more kind of buyer beware elements with a lease or PPA. You should carefully read that contract and make sure you know what the terms are and you understand them. Um, but it can be a useful tool in helping people go solar. Um, I should also say that um, so far in Pennsylvania, we haven't had any installers bid on our co-ops who even offer any kind of third-party ownership. So uh, if you're part of a solar co-op in Pennsylvania, it will likely not be an option for you, um, but it is important to still understand how those work. If you are ready to go solar and join a solar co-op, and if you believe you live in one of those areas with an active solar co-op, you can visit solarunitedneighbors.org slash co-ops slash Pennsylvania and find the link to join that co-op. And please tell your friends about this. You know, the larger we can grow these solar co-ops, the more solar we can put in Pennsylvania, the better deal each of these solar co-ops can earn when they, when they shop for installers um, and the more impact we can make. And, um, you know, any solar questions, you can always direct them our way at pateam at solarunitedneighbors.org. Thank you very much.